Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, okay, so uh, before I begin, uh, again, I would like to repeat the rules. So first of all, we have uh, two presenters here, uh, Dana Cohen and Shiri Dishon. Hi. Uh, so uh, let me repeat the rules just real fast. Uh, so you'll be given like 15 minutes exactly to present your work and I will give you three minutes. Uh, uh, I will inform you three minutes before the end of those 15 minutes. So please do not exceed this uh, time limit because it will deduct your points and I will, I will have to uh, cut your presentation off if you exceed these 15 minutes. And after the 15 minutes, we have discussion, five minutes discussion, and all the attendees are requested to uh, ask questions only during these five minutes of discussion part. And uh, again, you can put your questions in the chat box or ask, ask them by yourself. And uh, please, uh, all the attendees, please uh, try to keep your cameras on and just uh, keep yourself muted, but uh, keep your cameras on just because we wanna make it more lively. So, uh, so first we have uh, Shiri, uh, Shiri Dishon from Weizmann Institute. Uh, Shiri, you can go ahead and you know, start with your presentation. Thanks, I will share my screen. Okay, so do you see my screen? Yeah, we do. Okay, so thanks everyone for attending to my talk. I'm from the group of Professor Igor Lubomirsky and Professor Meir Lav. And I will speak today about the surface piezo electricity and pyro electricity in central symmetric alpha glycine. So first I will explain briefly what is the piezoelectric and what is the pyroelectric effect. So the piezoelectric effect is the ability of some dielect dielectric materials to generate electric, electric charge when subjected to mechanical stress. And we have two options to measure the piezoelectric effect. The first one is by the direct piezoelectric effect is when we apply strain or stress on the material, we compressed or contract our materials and we measure the voltage. And here is two uh, piezoelectric uh, equation where the D and the E is the piezoelectric coefficient that's coupled between the stress and the polarizations that induced or between the strain and the polarization that induced. And the second option to measure the piezoelectric effect is by the converse piezoelectric effect. When we apply voltage or electric field and we measure the displacement in the material, the strain. So here again, this is another two piezoelectric equation where D, the piezoelectric coefficient couples between the electric field and the strain, or E, it's, that, it's the other uh, coefficient that couples between the electric field and the stress. The pyroelectric effect is the ability of polar dielectric materials to generate electric, electric charge or voltage upon temperature change. And if we're looking on this material that has dipole moments and therefore spontaneous polarization, so uh, nearby ions or electrons will always attract to the surfaces of the material in order to compensate on the surface charge. Now, if we imagine that we're connect to the surfaces of the material conductive electrodes, and we connect these electrodes through an ammeter with low resistivity. And if the temperature is constant, so also the spontaneous polarization and no, uh, no uh, current will flow through this circuit. However, if we will hit the sample, there will be a change uh, in the dipole moment, usually the dipole moment and consequently the spontaneous polarization will decrease. And because of the change in the surface polarization and in order to compensate on the change, a current will flow through uh, this circuit. And this current is the pyroelectric current. If we would uh, uh, cool, the, cool down the, the sample instead of hitting, so the current will flow to the other uh, direction, direction because the, 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 the change in polarization will be the opposite. In our experiments, we are heating and cooling the sample with infrared laser. So when the, the laser is on, the, the sample is, uh, is hit. And when the, the laser is off, uh, the sample is cooled. Uh, the crystal symmetry is defined large variety of the material properties and pyroelectricity and the piezoelectricity is among these properties. 
the dielectric, uh, dielectric response is present in all materials that are not conductive and the piezoelectricity is present, is a property of dielectrics that lacking inversion symmetry or, or inversion center. By contrast, spiral electricity require polar crystallographic direction. So therefore from symmetry consideration, all the pyroelectric materials are also piezoelectric, but not necessarily the opposite. And we here to talk about the surfaces. So even though piezo require non-central symmetric symmetry and pyro require polar symmetry, all surfaces are polar, including in material with central symmetric symmetry. And I, will, I want to show you briefly what was done in our group about uh, the surface spiral electricity. So, and I saw that uh, Sylvia is here. So in 2013, using periodic temperature change technique by, uh, based on Chinovich method, our group uh, and Dr. Sylvia Piperno uh, found surface spiral electricity in crystals of central symmetric alpha glycine. The surface spiral electricity was found to be due to to the incorporation of water molecules during the crystal growth in the several hundred microns top and bottom surfaces layer of the, of the alpha glycin. And the total polarization was found to be extremely large. The, the polarization of the crystal was found to be preserved in ultra high vacuum. However, it disappeared when, when uh, hitting the crystal to 100 degrees. And this is because the water diffused outside of this surface layer. Later on, on 2013 and 19, sorry, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Marisa Deff from our group found pyroelectricity at a 100 surface of strontium titanate where the bulk pyroelectricity is symmetry prohibited. And the, uh, the pyroelectric layer was found to be extremely small, around one nanometer thick, but its polarization is comparable of the polarization of strong polar materials such as barium titanate. And let's talk now about the surface piezoelectricity. So every non-central symmetric layer should give piezoelectric response and therefore also surfaces. However, surface piezoelectricity is very hard to measure or does not exist at all. And this is because it even near surface layer with large piezoelectric coefficient will give small displacement, even at high applied voltage. And it can be explained by the next example. So. Let's look on this crystal with thickness D and surface with thickness delta. And now let's imagine that we apply on this crystal voltage V. So the piezoelectric equation that we can write is that the displacement equal to the piezoelectric coefficient multiplied by the, the voltage that fall on the surface layer, delta V. This voltage is equal to the electric field that multiplied by the, by the thickness of the surface layer delta. And the electric field is, of course, the voltage divided by D, the, the thickness of the crystal, because we apply the, the voltage on all the crystal and not only on the surface layer. Now, taking this electric field and insert it to the delta V, we're getting this expression of delta V. And, and if we take the delta V and put it back to the piezo equation, we're getting this equation. And from here, you can see that the displacement of the crystal as uh, in, uh, uh, in respect to the, the voltage that we apply is depends on the ratio between the thickness of the surface layer to the thickness of the crystal delta uh, divided by D. And in most single crystal, this ratio is in the magnitude of 10 to the minus five. And in order to, to have a measurable displacement, one should apply tens of thousands of volts. And this is the problem to detect piezoelectricity from the surface. So in order to succeed in the, in the mission of measuring surface piezoelectricity, we chose to work with the alpha glycine that as uh, I said uh, previously was found that uh, it's a uh, near surface layer can exceed 100 micron. So in general, glycine is the simplest amino acid and it is one of the building blocks of proteins and the alpha glycine polymorph as a mono, monoclinic uh, crystal, crystallographic structure and it's central symmetric from space group E to one over N. And let's go back now to the uh, piezoelectric equation. So we stopped here. And if I'm playing a little bit with the parameter, I, I can get what I colored in red. It's the piezoelectric uh, uh, effective coefficient because I call it effective because it's not the only the D to two, but it's the uh, parameter that is composed from only known or measurable parameters. 
it, it has the strength, the displacement is what we measure. D, it's the thickness of the crystal, it's known, and V is the voltage that we apply. So by applying voltage V and measure displacement U, we can now calculate the effective piezo coefficient. And if we would like to know the exact uh, D to two, we have to divide it by the delta, by the thickness of the surface layer. So from the previous work about the surface spiral electricity of the alpha gliding, they didn't know exactly the, the thickness of the surface layer from the experimental results. They just used theoretical calculations. So now moving to, to our results, uh, I, we wanted to know the exactly uh, thickness of the surface layer from experimental, uh, from our experimental result. So we used the pyroelectric current and we looked on the decay of the pyroelectric current with time, this graph. And we did fitting to this F function. This is based on the diffusion equation. And from this fitting, we were able to find delta S, which is the thickness of the surface layer, and J0, which is the pyroelectric current. And from the pyroelectric current, we were able to calculate the pyroelectric coefficient using this equation. And I will talk about the pyroelectric coefficient in, in the few next uh, slides. Uh, we found that in room temperature, the pyroelectric coefficient is 160 picocoulomb per centimeter square Kelvin. Uh, but what's important is that we found that the, the thickness of this surface layer is around 300 micron. And if you uh, look on this graph about the, the temperature dependent of the thickness of the surface layer, it is quite constant until 60 degrees, and then it rapidly dropped down and vanished completely at 70, at 70 degrees. And this implies us that the near surface layer is in fact a well-defined phase. Now going to the piezoelectric uh, measurement, we used a uh, Michelson-Morelli interferometer in order to, to measure the, the piezoelectricity. So as I said before, we applied voltage V and measure the displacement U. We use the converse piezoelectric effect. And then we were able to calculate the effective piezo coefficient. So in this graph, you can see the temperature dependent of the piezoelectric coefficient. And in uh, blue and black are crystals that we measured immediately after taking them out of their growth uh, solution. In green, it's, it's crystals that we cleaved is top and bottom faces, the faces that were in, in contact with the water during uh, the crystal growth. And as you can see, the expressed uh, 0, 1, 0, the top and the bottom phases of the alpha gliding shows detectable surface displacement as response to the applied voltage. And this is in contrast to the cleaved 0, 1, 0 uh, phases. It didn't show any uh, piezo response at all. Using the thickness of the surface layer, 300 microns that we found from the pyroelectric uh, measurement, we were able now to calculate the exact D to two, the piezo coefficient that we found that it's extremely low, 0 0.1 picometer per volt. Looking on the temperature dependent of the piezo coefficient, so it's decay from 40 degrees and almost completely vanished between 70 to 90 degrees. And if uh, we're comparing the temperature dependent of the pyroelectric uh, measurement, uh, we can see it by the thickness of the surface layers that we calculated from the pyroelectric measurement. So the pyroelectric, uh, the pyroelectricity is vanished completely at 70 degrees. However, the piezoelectricity, we have still signal between 70 degrees to 90 degrees. And this show us that there, there is a narrow temperature range that this near surface layer is still piezoelectric, but not pyroelectric. And this suggests that the water molecule diffused outside the near surface layer in this temperature range, but the lattice symmetry reduction did not disappear yet. And last result that I want to show you, it's the uh, secondary pyroelectric coefficient. So as I showed in, in a few slides uh, ago, uh, we calculated the pyroelectric coefficient from different temperature. This is in red. Uh, you have about three minutes left. Okay. Yeah. And we, we estimated also the, piezo, the, piezoelectric, uh, the secondary pyroelectric coefficient from the piezoelectric coefficient. And the secondary pyroelectric coefficient characterized the contribution to the total change in polarization that coming from the change in crystal dimensions due to the thermal expansion. We were able to estimate it by multiply the piezoelectric coefficient with the thermal expansion coefficient and Young's modulus of lighting. 
And we found that the calculated secondary pyroelectric coefficient is 12% from the total one. And this uh, implies that the polarization in the near surface layer is induced predominantly by the water as the guest molecule with minimum polar distortions that introduced to the host lattice. And I want to conclude. So I showed that uh, the case of alpha glycine is experimental evidence of the existence of surface piezoelectric effect. And the polarization in the near surface layer induced by the guest water molecules with minimum polar distortions that introduced to the host lattice. In this case, I worked with crystal of alpha glycine that comprised from molecule with large dipole moment. And in the future, I would like to study crystals with smaller dipole moment and, and to grow them in different solvent in order to see how it will affect the piezo and pyro. Uh, and in addition, I think this is an important method that can provide information about the mechanism of crystal growth, for example, classical versus non-classical. And I want to end with uh, saying that stereo specific incorporation of gas molecules can provide a way to control the piezoelectric and pyroelectric effect of crystals. And I want to thanks to everybody that took part in this project from uh, our, for, for our group and from uh, the Ural Federal University. And of course, thank you for listening and I will be happy to, to answer any question. Thank you so much, Shiri. Uh, uh, Guys, if you have any questions, please put them forward. Okay, so no questions from the uh, attendees. Okay, so I have a few. Uh, first, uh, I would like to ask why, I mean, you use alpha glycine, right? Because of the, uh, because it's uh, NSL is around 100 uh, microns. So which other materials do you have, uh, I mean, can you use uh, which have similar type of NSL uh, size range? In our group, uh, previous work was done about different amino acids like uh, DL uh, serine uh, or uh, uh, aspartic acid, uh, but all the crystals that were used should be uh, with central symmetric symmetries. They should not have uh, uh, pyroelectricity or piezoelectricity from the back. Uh, uh, so, we, so we will be able to see the pyroelectricity or piezoelectricity from the surface. Uh, I can say that we, we grew these crystals, the, the glycine crystals, uh, in, with, together with methanol or ethanol, where the methanol and the ethanol uh, 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 was incorporated in the bulk of the crystal. And we were still uh, uh, was able to see the, the signal from the surface and the signal from the back because there, there are different, uh, they look different. So sometimes we can uh, still work with crystals that have uh, uh, pyro piezo from the back, but we prefer to work with crystals that are central symmetric. Okay, and uh, another thing, uh, you grew these crystals by yourselves in your lab and uh, how did you grow them? Which method or any specific we're growing, method? We're mm -hmm. growing them uh, in, in slow ev evaporation uh, method. We're just mi mixing powder of glycine. And if you want to uh, dopant, so we, we also mix it with dopant. And we heat it to, uh, I don't know, 80 degrees temperature. And then we put it in the growth, uh, in the growth solution in different uh, uh, crystallization glasses and wait and and cool it uh, and cool it down and the crystal grows very quickly like one two days. Okay. Uh, another thing was um, you said that I mean uh, you use this for what purpose? Are you like do you have a, an application plan for it or you're just studying the uh, characteristics of uh, I mean, like how does it behave in different yeah so this uh, work was started because uh, this central symmetric crystal should not have uh, a, a pyroelectricity and when uh, uh, the people that work about it uh, checked it they saw the pyroelectricity and then they started to to look from where it's coming from, they, they found that it's from the water molecules that uh, incorporate in, inside the, the crystals. So we took it it's one step ahead and we are now I'm working on incorporating uh, other uh, amino acid molecules inside the glycine or inside other materials. And in order to, 
uh, uh, to look or, or to, to do research about the, the uh, molecular level of the pyro electricity and the, and the piezo electricity. And if we can uh, uh, control the pyro electricity and the, and the piezo electricity uh, uh, separately. Uh, so if we will, if we are uh, uh, introducing large molecules to the to the lattice, we will we will get large piezo electricity because we will change the dimensions uh, locally around the the dopant. But if we will take small molecule, for example, uh, alcohols, uh, so there is a different uh, a large difference in the polarization between the glycine molecules that it uh, uh, it exchange and the the alcohol molecules, but the dimension around the the dimension around the dopant is is there is not is there is small change, and therefore there will be a, a large difference in the pyro electricity, but small difference in the piezo electricity. So now we're trying to understand how we can control the pyro and the piezo separately, and this started in this work when we understood that we can uh, uh, incorporate molecules in in the lattice and in introduce uh, pyroelectricity or piezoelectricity. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, any more questions for, for Shiri? Okay, thank you so much Shiri for a great presentation. And uh, uh, now we'll move on to Dana. Uh, you can start sharing your screen and let's hear you. Now, can you hear me? Okay, so I will show it again. Sorry. Can you see? Yeah, sure. And hear me, okay. Uh, great. So, hi everyone, my name is uh, Dana and I will be presenting today my research about the uh, structural characterization and crystallization kinetics of a supermolecular system in a microfluidic platform. Uh, this uh, study was under the supervision of Professor Sishacham from the Department of Material Science and Engineering and Professor Liad Abramovich from the Department of Oral Biology School of Dental Medicine from Tel Aviv University. I will start the presentation with a short introduction to molecular self-assembly. Molecular self-assembly begins from local interactions among molecules. When a trigger is applied, they spontaneously and independently from ordered supermolecular structure like smart puzzle pieces as illustrated in this school movie. The self-assembly process is of great significance in biology, chemistry, and material science. One ver very relevant example of COVID-19 is the self-assembly that occurs every time we wash our hands. Soap is made from molecule called fatty acids. Those molecules have a hydrophilic end that is attracted to water and a hydrophilic chain that is attracted to viruses and germ like the coronavirus. When you wash your hands, the large hydrophobic chain cluster around the particle of the corona, leaving the hydrophilic end sticking out surrounded by water. This self-assembled corona trap helps help the water peel it off your hands and leave our skin clean. So it's important to wash our hands and I think that self-assembly is really cool. Uh, another thing that is uh, inspiring people from the self-assembly phenomenon is that they have a lot of uh, applications, like for example, an ultra-sensitive sensor, they used for drug delivery, and in Lee's lab, we also uh, investigating 3D hydrogel uh, scaffolds for tissue engineering. My research, I explored the self-assembly of FMOC pentafluorophenine and alin, a modified amino acid based on the FMOC group. So this is the FMOC group marked in black and the uh, phenyl uh, group with the fluorine uh, on it. So this building block is well studied. Recently, our lab demonstrated the antibacterial activity of uh, this molecule against Streptococcus mutans for dental medicine application. We incorporated the nanostructure into a composite material and showed that it exhibits uh, antibacterial properties and also maintaining its biocompatible. In addition, it maintains its optical properties. So 
you can see that the tooth didn't change your color and it's still white. It's very important. And for this reason, this building block is of great importance for tissue engineering in general and particularly in dentistry. So what is the motivation of my research? Supermolecular self-assembly is a key process in natural system allowing for the formation of structure with a wide range of functionalities. But gaining control over the assembly of building blocks in a precise manner is a major challenge. Therefore, there's a great need to provide fundamental insight into the mechanism governing the self-assembly of such building block. So in my research, I focus on enhancing the understanding of the mechanism underlying the self-assembly of the well-studied building block, FMOC pentafluorophenylalanine as a model system. So in not so many words, I'm looking to understand the self-assembly process of this building block in order to be able to control it and to design tailor-made materials for tissue engineering, for example. So how did I do it? First of all, I characterized the effect of virus solvent condition on the resulting morphology. I used high resolution structural analysis for exploring those nanostructures. I combined microfluidic approach, to visual the supermolecular nanostructure in real time. And finally, I applied kinetic modeling to gain comprehensive understanding of the kinetic as well as the thermodynamic of this system. I want to say that uh, this study was recently published in Chemistry of Material Journal and was selected for the journal front cover. And it was in collaboration with the Professor Knowles Group from Cambridge University and Dr. David Levy from the Wolfson, Wolfson Research Center in Tel Aviv University. So I will present you some of the results in my manuscript. First of all, how to prepare this uh, building block is very easy with the solvent switch method. We uh, take the monomers that and, so, and dissolve them in organic solvent, for example, ethanol and DMSO. Then we dilute it in aqua solution to initiate the spontaneous self-assembly, creating hydrogen as presented in the inverted tube on the right. I used 96 well plate to systematically study the effect of different conditions on the self-assembly process. I, the ratio of the organic solvent, for example, the DMSO, varied from 10 to 100%. And the concentration of the amino acid was very from 0 0.2 to uh, 10 gram per liter. And what was interesting is that I saw that I have a phase, a, a phase transition that occurs uh, depending on the solvent ratio. So in lower ratio of DMSO, I can see fibrillary gel, but in higher, different, uh, in higher ratio of DMSO, I can see crystals embedded within the gel. And an opposite trend of this transition transition occurs when I use ethanol as the, um, as the organic solvent. In lower ethanol, get crystals within the gel. It higher and at higher ethanol ratio, get fibrillary, um, fibrillary gel. So these results show a clear phase behavior of this same molecule under different condition. And this study can help us choose the suitable condition for our specific need. Next, I apply the trans transmitting electron microscopy, TEM for the morphological characterization of the gel phase. As, I, as you can see, I saw that in ethanol, I get the, those uh, uh, long and thin fibrils, and in DMSO, I get right-handed twisted nanoribbons. So I also um, measured the uh, ribbon pitch and twisted width without, uh, with the help of uh, image software. In addition, I characterized the, the gel phase, after I characterized the gel phase, I wanted to characterize the crystal phase with, with the help of uh, Dr. David Levy uh, with powder X-ray diffraction. And I can see that the gel phase in both solvent exhibit the diffraction pattern, the typical to amorphous material. It's the black, the green, and gray lines. Also the blue line, that it's the crystal phase in ethanol exhibit the uh, amorphous uh, pattern, but with the small, small peaks that indicate that uh, within the crystals, there are small uh, crystals, like I told you, in the, in the gel. Uh, what was exciting is that in the DMSO, we get a sharp peak uh, that uh, can indicate of uh, an ordered crystal. And those results was very exciting for us since no one saw this crystal structure before. Instead, researchers designed the corresponding peptoids of FMOC pentafluoro. The chemical structure of a peptoid shifted the side chain of a peptide from the alpha carbon to the nitrogen group. So, so far, no one could crystallize and solve the crystal structure of the peptide, only the corresponding peptoid. But in our study, we could overcome this challenge and resolve for the first time the crystal structure uh, of this uh, uh, building block. And uh, sorry, 
want this. And you can see here in, uh, in SAM that we, we can see that uh, we get the uh, um, needle-like crystals. This is the crystal that we get. In addition, we know that there are two molecular parast molecules for asymmetric units. That, uh, uh, um, it's a monoclinic crystal system with the space group of P21. And we saw that the, uh, what's stable as the structure uh, is an aromatic interaction, pi pi interaction between the F phenyl group and between the F mock F mock group. And uh, this is the 3D uh, structure of uh, the crystals. So to further explore the kinetic and dynamic of the self-assembly, uh, I used real-time monitoring uh, with microfluidic approach. The microfluidic device I used consists of two inlets, long and narrow channel allowing the homogeneous mixing of the two solutions, and a main channel with uh, 50 micron pillars allowing to interrupt structure uh, inside. So in contrast to the bulk uh, solution experiment described before, in this setup, I have constant flow of monomer added to the system. So why use this system? First of all, it's give me real-time monitoring on the processes. In addition, I can uh, uh, study the nucleation and grow kinetic of the uh, monomers. And uh, finally, the assemblies can be image monitored and analyzed. So what I got is a really nice video that shows that I have another, uh, um, another phase in the system. Here in the middle, you can see spheres that are disappearing. Instead of them, I have the grow of uh, fibrils and crystals. So this was really cool because I only can see the spheres uh, in this uh, setup, real-time monitoring, and they are not stable. And I can tell that we can think that uh, the FMO pentafluoro appears to be thermodynamically driven, follow Ostwald rule of stages, whereby a monomer of metastable uh, species can be substituted into forming more energetically favorable species. And I also can uh, see the uh, how the spheres are disappearing and instead the crystals and the fibers go grow. To simplify it, I like to think about it as a roller coaster of energy that forwards the energy from the monomers to spheres to the fibers and finally to the crystals that is the most stable uh, state of this building. Block. In addition, by the help of the microfluidics, I could uh, control the temperature, change the temperature and see the growth just of just the crystals. As I, the, uh, as I increase the temperature, the grow is much faster and I can learn from it. In, in order to learn from it, I use the johnson melavrami kolmogorov theory of crystallization. And it's a very known uh, uh, theory that uh, was successful for inorganic crystals and polymer crystals. So I wanted to try it for my system. And with, by the help of this equation, I could, uh, uh, I could uh, get the kinetic parameters N and K. And N is the slope and K is the activation energy of the um, process. And interestingly, I can, I can see that the value of N is almost one and a half that is close to the expected uh, value of two that is one dimensional growth. So I can say that my process is heterogeneous nucleation with one dimensional road like growth. This is what the model found, and this is exactly what I get in the, uh, in the results that I have in the macrofluidics. In addition, I could put the Arrhenius uh, equation and extract the, uh, um, the activation energy. So the activation energy is uh, in line with the aromatic interaction that I found in the crystal structure. So to summary this section, the results show that the JMAK model described quite accurately the nucleation and growth of the amino acid the base system. So in conclusion, I focused on the FMO pentafluorophenylalanin as a model system to gain physiochemical understanding on the fundamental principle underlying the self-assembly mechanism of a functionally relevant nanostructure. Characterized with a high resolution structural analysis the nanostructure, and I find out that in different solvent, I get different nanostructures. In addition, I could solve the, uh, the, the, the crystal structure with the use of powder X-ray diffraction that gave me a lot of information about how the, uh, this structure is stabilized. I also use the microfluidic approach to uh, get real-time monitoring and that, that made me help to discover the sphere phase that is uh, not stable and disappearing. And then I also could uh, uh, apply the uh, kinetic modeling of the JMAK uh, crystallization model. And uh, these results and this knowledge can help me 
uh, design telomed materials for biomedical application and science and material science application. So finally, I would like to thank and acknowledge uh, my supervisor, Professor Liad Abramovich and Professor Yossi Sacham, and of course, uh, all the group members that uh, helped me and my collaborators, uh, Thomas Knowles and uh, Woody Gazit, and the founding. And I want to also thank the IVS uh, student committee that uh, gave me the opportunity to present my uh, research. Uh, so thank you very much. And if you have uh, questions, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dana. Uh, yeah, there is a question. Yes, please go ahead. Hi, Hi. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk, Dana. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, what was the reason that you choose this specific mo uh, molecule to investigate? I mean, there are other modified amino acids. So why did you choose this one? So thank you for the questions. Uh, thank you for the questions. So, so uh, as I said, I will just uh, show you just a second, that uh, this molecule, this amino acid, right, I could chose a lot of other ones, but first of all, it's very easy to, uh, to prepare it, like I saw in the solvent switch method. And also, okay, and also uh, we saw that it has antibacterial properties. This is what uh, was really special for us. This is why we want to investigate how to control this amino acid specifically, because we can then use it for a biomedical application. It's also biocompatible, also, also a, um, antibacterial, so it's a, we can re really use it. And another thing, sorry, is, so, okay, so we, we are designing 3D scaffold for bone regeneration, so we need to find peptides and amino acid uh, for this reason, and we also try to co-assemble this specific building block, DEFMOC Pentaflow, with another building block that we're using, DEFMOC FF, and we found out that it has a synergistic effect on the mechanical properties. So this building block is very interesting, we like, we want to study it, but I think we can definitely try uh, more uh, amino acids. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question. Uh... Yeah. Yes. Hi, Dana. First of all, thank you. It was very interesting. Um, I have a question. You show that um, uh, you uh, the effect of the solvent on the crystal formation. Uh, I would like to ask if uh, in the microfluidic you also check in both uh, solvents the, uh, that you, sh you show the, the fast transition. And uh, another question is, you, you, um, the spheres in the fast transition, I understand it's like very quick changing to, uh, uh, to the fibers. Um, can you freeze the situation? Can you like uh, uh, change something in the condition and just make this uh, peptide to be the endpoint with spheres and not with fibers? And if so, what is the implications of these, these um, different structures? Okay, so thank you. I, I start with the first uh, question. So yes, I tried with, I mean, I have two solvents, the MSO and ethanol. And uh, I did try with ethanol uh, to do it in the microfluidics, but as you can see, it's, it's a different, um, first I have the crystals and then I have the gel. And if I'm trying to do it, um, I can't really have anything. I get I get gel sticked inside the, uh, the microfluidic, the, the channels, and I can't really look at it. I can't flow the monomers and the, I did try it, but I couldn't do it. Maybe I need to try more conditions, uh, even though I tried a lot, but uh, I can always uh, try. And the second, uh, this, uh, answer your question, hold on. Uh, the, the second question is uh, if you can, freeze the situation and leave the peptide as a spheres, although it's not stable, but have, so, have you, okay. Yeah, so, okay, so um, no, the answer is no. I, I did try because uh, we know that, sphere, that if we get spheres or uh, nanoparticles of this amino acid, we can use it for drug delivery and uh, it, we can really benefit from this. But uh, unfortunately I couldn't, I tried the, uh, uh, to decrease the reaction, uh, um, like to cool it so it will happen more slowly. And I tried to uh, freeze it in liquid nitrogen, but unfortunately I couldn't. I couldn't just leave the spheres. It's always, it's kind, it's probably not, that, not stable 
it couldn't remain I couldn't remain it uh, stable enough to to visualize it or to I don't know work with it it's, the, it's immediately transformed to fibers and crystals okay thank you thank you uh, I have uh, any any more questions okay yeah we have more questions uh, Nitai go ahead uh, I would like, please, if you uh, may elaborate a bit more about the kinetic model you showed before. Um, yeah. One. Yeah, so yeah. Um, you want to say something? Uh, no, I would like to understand it a bit. Okay, so this is a, a, a nucleation and growth uh, model. Okay, what I did is uh, I with the, with the help of the microfluidics, I could monitor the growth, only the growth of the crystals. I focused only on the growth of the crystals in different temperature from 25 to 55 Celsius degree. And then I could plot the, oh, sorry. Then I could plot the, the area, calculated the area of the crystals with this uh, square area that I chose for each individual crystal. And uh, it's the, uh, the area versus time. You can see that we get a sigmoidal uh, shape. This means that it could uh, be good for the for this specific model that I chose. Of course, I can choose another model and to see if it uh, if it will fit. And uh, this equation um, describes this model. And then, if you can, if you plot it different way, if you take line on both sides of the equation, and then you plot it like this, you get a straight line. You get like a linear equation, and then you can uh, extract the n from the slope and the lung can from the, the section. And you can uh, figure with, by the help of the end this, this specific uh, constant that what is the uh, nucleation and growth mechanism. So what I saw that it's almost two and this uh, like by the theory of it, it uh, fits to heterogeneous nucleation with bi-dimensional road-like grow. And this is exactly what I saw. I saw those needle-like crystals that grow in one, dim one di uh, dimension and um, so this is the okay, great. Thanks. This is covered. Thank you. Uh, just uh, one more question. Uh, before uh, this slide, uh, like I think in the beginning or maybe in the middle, you showed uh, the strand, the strand with the uh, pitch and uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here. Yeah. So I mean, how do you do you measure the the diameters or uh, do you have any like yes. So I used you, the Im image a software. I took okay. the yeah, I took the the image from the TAM, and I measure it a, a, a lot of times to see uh, the, the the wide of the pitch, the wide of the pitch, like this, and the uh, the the pitch uh, uh, the twist of the pitch. Okay, and uh, another thing, like you while doing your microfluidics uh, setup. Uh, during the microfluidic setup, you again showed uh, the sim a similar uh, uh, images, right? So like you do it in real time or, I mean, I don't know how, yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, so, so I do it in, in real time. I will, okay. Uh, wait, the video is not that moving. Okay. Yes, yeah, so yeah. I, yeah. So okay, I do yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So when you do it like in real time, like how, how do you set it up? Like it's, I'm just curious. Okay, so I, I can't really like, ah, okay, good. Now, I, now I can, okay, so we, I have two inlets, okay? From one, I uh, insert the stock solution. It's the peptide uh, in the DMSO or ethanol. And from the other inlet, I, I, uh, and I uh, inject the water. Okay, they, they are mixing inside the channel, and then they are coming here to this uh, to this big channel that I can observe. I, the microscope, I mean, the camera is here. I focus on a specific area, and I just let it flow, let it flow in a very slow flow rate, and uh, this is what I got. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dana, uh, thank you. and thank you all for attending. Uh, very nice presentations by both the both our presenters and uh, we have now another 10 minutes break and we'll meet you in the career panel okay thank you bye-bye all the best bye-bye